Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we're happy to be joined today by Professor Chris Marsh, Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Maryland College Park. And she is joining us today to talk about her wonderful and exciting new book, The Love Jones Cohort, Single and Living Alone in the Black Middle Class, published by Cambridge University Press just this year. How are you doing today? I Professor am, Marsh. I am fantastic, Dr. Mark Anthony Neal. <laughs> it is truly a pleasure to be with here, be here with you. One, to just hang out with you, but two, to also talk about the book. So thank you so much for having You're me. You're welcome. Our colleague Mary Patillo writes of the Love Jones cohort. A skillful combination of demography and qualitative interviews, the Love Jones cohort is the defining reference on the rise and reality of Black middle-class singledom. Marsh <laughs> offers a highly original take on the path to and consequences of forgoing parenting, marriage, and cohabitation. It is a central reading for scholars of the family and the Black community. High praise there, Chris. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mary Patillo. I appreciate that. That's fantastic. So what immediately I imagine for a certain cohort of Black folks that attracts them to this book is the title. Yes. Uh, those of us who grew up around and in the dropping of, of Love Jones in the late 1990s. Negro, what are you doing here? You let me buy you dinner. <laughs> okay, the Billy D thing is a little played out, but I will give you 10 cool points for nostalgia's sake. There have been a whole bunch of bad traveling Love Jones musicals <laughs> <laughs> and, and all kinds of references to the film. Um, none of it which in any ways challenge the classic significance of the film, but I think this book might. Yeah. So talk a little bit about the title of the book and, and this idea of the Love Jones cohort. You know, it's so funny. When you write a book with an interesting title, one of two things is going to happen. Certain people are going to pick it up and be like, oh, so they like on a, they're going to nod like, oh, okay, I see what you did there, Dr. Marsh. <laughs> and people just buy the book because of the title. <laughs> Other people are so intrigued. They're like, what does this mean? I'm going to go ahead and get the book. One of my colleagues in criminology, he said, Dr. Marsh, I have no idea what the Love Jones means. So I'm going to buy the book and read it. And then he read it and really enjoyed the book. But let me tell you what the, where the title actually came from. From. So, of course, the movie Love Jones. But if we back up just a little bit, and if we think of like the quintessential Black middle class family on TV, who do we often default to? The That's Huxtables. The yeah, yeah, the Huxtables, a middle class or upper middle class for that matter, right? So the Huxtables on the Cosby show. But then we started to see a demographic shift where we moved mm -hmm. away from that character and we moved to a demographic of young Black professionals who weren't married and didn't have any children. And Love Jones, which, is, which celebrates its 26th anniversary this year, was the first on the big screen to kind of make that demographic shift. So the book in some ways is paying homage and respect to the producers of the Love Jones because they moved us away from this heteronormative mother, father, 2.5 kids and a black picket fence to young black professionals who aren't married, don't have any children, being in the middle class. So I decided to play, have a play on the the movie Love Jones. And then I wanted to use a demographic term. So I used cohort. It's really funny because um, I had to do Author Meets Critic a little while ago. And it was a woman who had wrote a book about women and their job, their labor market. And so her publisher told her, don't use cohort in the book because the reader wouldn't understand what they were saying. And I was like, well, I put cohort in the title of my book because people that may not have access to higher education, I want to teach them something. So I taught them a new word and cohort is nothing more than a band of people. So the Love Jones cohort is me being a professor, always trying to teach somebody <laughs> and then me paying homage and respect to media because media tends to have that conversation right where the black middle class doesn't just look like married couples with children, but the scholarship was a little bit lagged and it was a little bit behind and they weren't having that same conversation. There are a couple of moves here that I think that are really significant that you make. Uh, when you hear the term single 
and living alone. And, and we'll talk a little bit in a moment about the distinction between Sala, as you describe it, and the Love Jones cohort. We typically think of women. Um, and, and it's interesting, right, because you title the book around a media reference. And I think for most Americans, when they think about single and living alone, they automatically go back to the early 1970s and, and it's Mary Tyler Moore, right? Then it might be Murphy Brown, though Murphy Brown has a child. Um, it's typically single white women leaving alone, living alone, right? You could just think about that film, Single White Woman, right, that they came out in the 1990s. Um, but as you write in the book, you know, there becomes this spate of cultural icons, really, in, in terms of television shows and films, uh, living single girlfriends, uh, being Mary Jane, um, insecure in, in recent years. Go, shawty. It's my birthday, but no one cares because I'm not having a party. That shifted the narrative to say that, you know what, Black women are experiencing this also. And I think immediately when I saw the book and I thought about its implications, I expected that it would solely be about Black women living single and living alone. Um, talk about the kind of gender gap and, and why you chose to include both women and men um, in your study. Yes, that's a great question. And I grappled with that. As a scholar, I had to make some hard, fast decisions. And after thinking about it, grappling with it, I decided to include men in the conversation. And I'm actually really glad that I made that decision. Because at the end of the day, yes, Black women dominate the category, but there are Black men that fall in the demographics of the Love Jones cohort. And I'm so happy that I included them because there's a lot of, um, there's a few gender differences, differences mm -hmm. that showed up in the book. Had I not included the men in the book, we wouldn't have been able to kind of tease out some of that conversation. So one of the things, but I also am very sensitive to Black women because I am a Black woman. So one of the things I have thought about, still thinking, this is like the, the, the first, this could be a first in a series. I could write a second book that just focuses on Black women and maybe um, pitch that more to a trade press. But right now, when I talk about the Love Jones cohort, I am talking about both men and women, but it's clear that women do dominate the category. And to your other point about like Murphy Brown, you know, one of the things I say in the book, and I'm really emphatic about this, I talk about how a lot of the scholarship around singlehood right now has a white face or a white gaze. And so I wrote the book in part because I wanted to say we're going to pay respect and we're going to give pay homage and we're going to give flowers to black women because black women have shown everybody how to do singlehood and how to do it in an efficient kind of way. Now that other racial and ethnic groups, i.e. white women, have joined the bandwagon, now it's no longer pathologized and now it's a hot, sexy topic and everyone's, everybody wants to talk about it. But in the book, I am explicit and I, I go back to 1919 data in 1900 all the way until 2020 to show that black women have been dominating the category it's a conversation we need to have and they need they need their flowers or we need our flowers you know there's a sense that for academic writers for scholars that one way or the other the scholarship that we engage is somewhere about ourselves or something about our own path and and i'm wondering when you were sitting in the 1990s watching things like living single or watching the film Love Jones, did, did you ever think as you're consuming that stuff 25, 30 years ago, that this would ever be part of a research agenda that you would take on as a scholar, you know, 20 years later? No, I can't say I actually thought that it would it would turn out like this. Happy that it did, but didn't think it would turn out like this. But what is interesting is, um, and to your point, yeah, is this a sociology of me? I do fall in the demographic, but I think it's a much larger conversation. But when mm -hmm. I was in graduate school being trained as a demographer and looking at how marriage rates were changing for all racial and ethnic groups, but more pronounced for Black Americans, I also moved into what me, my sisters and I bought a house in Lamert Park and three other people on our block were single and living alone. And I was like, I don't know that scholarship, the scholarship is really picking up the demographic trends that are happening on the ground. So as I'm also watching the movies, I'm like, okay, yeah. So the wheels were turning. I just didn't know they were turning. I did not know we would be here. But so again, so happy that we are here. Your cohort is largely from the DMV. 
um, you know, DC, Maryland, Virginia, uh, yes. for those who don't know <laughs> the acronym. Um, do, do you think that particular region gives you outcomes that are a little different than how in, than if you would have picked a group of folks in the deep south or on the west coast, like where you're from? You know, I'm not really sure. I I I would argue probably yes, because in the DMV, when I first moved here, because I'm from LA, I was like, why are you guys so obsessed with the Department of Motor Vehicles, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right. But in the DMV, you have a high percentage of people that are single, so it makes it easier. I have left so many open questions for graduate students to pick up the baton and carry yeah, the conversation yeah. forward, because how does the Love Jones cohort play out in the deep south in Mobile, Alabama? How does it play out on the West Coast in California? So I decided to focus on the DMV, especially because I was just telling Eric earlier, um, the producer, that Prince George's County is one of the wealthiest black counties mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to focus on people that were solid middle class. So that's why I decided to focus on the DMV, but open to see if this holds up in other areas, excited to see the geographical differences. You know, I was listening uh, to an interview that you did with our friends over in the New Book Network, um, and, and you mentioned, you know, when folks think about living single, right, and alone, um, we tend to want to think about it in, as almost a, a, a sign of trauma, you know, that they're carrying some negative weight with them. And you suggested there are people who had, that you interviewed that at some point become really comfortable with the ability to live single and alone and be happy at the same time, you know, what distinguishes those folks who are happy about being part of the Love Jones cohort and, and those folks who aren't? Right. So, you know, one of the things that I'm really trying to do with the book is I'm really trying to destigmatize singlehood and the idea of being mm. single, right? Mm. Because so many people are hell bent on not being single, that they'll be in relationships that are toxic, abusive, unfulfilling, and even oppressive because they don't want to hold the title of single. And so what I really wanted to do is I wanted to talk to people that were single and living alone and talk about their lives. I'm like, what kind of lives do you live? How are you doing? What do you? Ha what makes you happy? What kind of freedom do you have? Because I didn't want to just have the conversation on why aren't you getting married? And a lot of the people talked about being content with their singleness. Now, yeah. and one one chapter in the book, I talked about whether or not you're single by choice or you're single by circumstance. And a lot of people said they were single by choice, but then they talked about how circumstances brought them to their singleness. And yeah. whether or not it's by choice or because of circumstances, people typically were happy with their singlehood. And one of the key reasons why they were happy is that is because they had friends and they had a mm -hmm. network mm -hmm. that they could draw from to help them navigate their singleness. And that's really, really, really important because what happens a lot of times is that people get married. Let me pause right here because I want to say this in every interview that I do. I am not anti-marriage and I am not anti-Black <laughs> love. But as sure as my name is Chris Marsh, I'm going to get hate mail because when you see a book that says single, <laughs> you think I'm saying, oh, Black women don't need no man. We to do it all right, on our right, own. Right, and that's right, right, not right. the conversation that I'm having. I'm all about healthy marriages, mm -hmm, healthy, mm -hmm. whole relationships. Yeah. Yes, and relationships, right? So it is important that I put that caveat out there. But I also think what's really important is that a lot of people talk about getting married and they put all of their eggs in the marriage basket and they don't still continue to cultivate their friendships or their partnership basket. And so the Love Jones cohort, they've cultivated friends. They have friends for different aspects of their lives. They have friends that they go to church with, that they play golf with, that they go to brunch with. And some of the data is pretty clear suggesting that long-term singles actually tend to be happier as they age, because they do have this network. But when you have people that are partnered or married, when they find themselves returning back to singlehood, they're not as happy because they don't, they didn't build these non-romantic nurturing relationships. They didn't cultivate those. And so yeah. friends play a huge role in being, having a successful singlehood life. Do you find that the men in the Love Jones cohort are as adaptable to creating these networks as the women are? 
No. And that's why I'm really happy that I included the men in the book so that I can we can normalize non-romantic nurturing relationships. The women in the cohort are clear. They got their sister circle. They got their girlfriends. They got their homegirls that help them navigate these non-romantic nurturing relationships that are really important to them. Men in the cohort didn't really talk about these non-romantic nurturing relationships. And in some ways, what they did say is that I'm afraid to have these non-romantic nurturing relationships because I'll thought of as being soft or I'll thought of as being gay. So I right. really hope once we read the book, we can normalize men having these non-romantic nurturing relationships that are deep and nurturing relationships that can navigate, they can help navigate the can help navigate their singleness. Yeah. How about in terms of gender, their relationships with marriage? Um, the women that you talk to generally are, con are fine with the fact that they may never marry. You mentioned that some of the men are holding out <laughs> right, <laughs> until they get to marriage. And, and I wanted to throw something in there, you know, as you as we discuss that particular part of the cohort, because this is something I also hear from married men who choose to stay married. Um, you know, as they get older, wanting to have someone who's going to take care of them. Right. As we talk about it in terms of health care and mental health and, and things of that nature. Right. So here's what is so baffling to me. So two things. One, people think like, OK, again, I am not anti-marriage, but people think marriage is a panacea. If I can just get married, all of my social ills are going to go away. I'm like, well, I don't understand why you think that. And why do you think just because you're partnered or married, your spouse is going to show up for you or your partner is going to show up for you? There's actually some recent data out there suggesting that spouses don't know how to navigate uh, sick spouses. And so they're mm -hmm. actually leaving. And I was like, your friends will show up for you. Your spouses may or <laughs> <Will> may <leave>. not. <laughs> right. They pack up and leave. <laughs> All right. 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 Like I just signed up for this. I know they said until death do us part, but I'm not cool with this. So I think that uh, we have a certain, I a certain idea and I think we're conditioned in a certain kind of way. And then there's also this thing about, I'm afraid to be alone. I don't want to die alone. I, we've been conditioned from a very young age that you don't want to die alone. You don't want to die in your house for five days. Nobody can find you and so on and so forth. Yeah. And now we're picking out of our fear. Get yourself some friends, check in with your friends. Then you won't be alone. Talk about the middle class piece here. Um, there's no shortage of single and living alone Black folks in the working class amongst the Black poor. Um, we actually talk a great deal, I think, about single Black men in that context um, because of their inability to partner <laughs> with, with more fluent Black women. Uh -huh. um, how important was for you to frame this in the context of talking about middle class life? What are the implications of that for you? So this goes back to like my decision I made early on in my academic career. And one of the things I said early on, and I stand by that, I said that I was not going to pimp the poor to make <laughs> my academic career. Now, I'm a, I'm, I am a woman of faith, and the Bible even talks about how the poor will be with us for all time. But I, there, there's a lot of people that don't look like me that talk about the Black poor. And I wanted to talk about, in spite of all the isms that Black America has to go through, I wanted to look at people who, quote unquote, did everything right. They went to college, they got the big houses, mm -hmm. they got the big degrees, mm -hmm. they got the big, uh, the big um, uh, uh, occupations. But at the end of the day, their outcome don't look the same as other racial and ethnic groups to clearly show you that racism still exists in America. And so for me, I did not want to pimp the poor. All of my research in one way or another looks at understanding the Black middle class because it's easy to always say, oh, they're just poor. I was like, okay, so they're not poor. Now what's the conversation? Now what, what comeback do you have? So everything that I've ever done has a, has a Black middle class lens to it because I think it's important to understand all of Black America, sure. to understand the poor, but it's equally important to understand the black middle class. And in that vein, one of the things I really appreciate about the book, and people have said that they've learned something with the book, I talk about estate planning. And how, especially if you're single and living alone, you need to have estate planning. I think the data in the book, I think 30% of Black Americans have a will or a living trust, and only 25% of the cohort have a will or a living trust. And especially if you're single and living alone, you don't have a spouse, you don't have a partner, you don't have children, you really need to think about who you're going to transfer your wealth to. That becomes a really big implication. So I, people have said that after reading the book, they've put their trust or their living will, their living wills or trust together. So I appreciate that the book has practical application. And you mentioned, you know, that that being single and middle class and black 
it's not a panacea, right? You know, there are many discriminatory aspects of American life that discriminate against people who are single. Can you talk a little bit about some of those challenges? Right. So, you know, there's two arguments in the book that I thought people were going to push back on. One argument that I make, I'm talking about, I'm using intersectionality as my mm -hmm. overarching kind of theoretical framework. And if we think about the matrix of domination, we have like race, class, and gender in this matrix of domination. And so I argue in the book that it should be race, class, gender, and singleism in the matrix of domination. I thought I was going to get pushback, and I don't. But let me tell you where I do get pushback. So I also argue that seeing people that are single and living alone should be considered a family of one. Mm. If we use the Census Bureau definition of a family, a family is someone that you're related to by blood, marriage, or adoption. So I, Chris Marsh, do not show up in the census data as a family. I show up as a household. Here's where I think that that's highly problematic because uh, three, give me three examples. One's benign and one's more egregious. So if I want to go get the cell phone family plan on my one cell phone, I want a discount on my one cell phone. <laughs> if I, if I want to go on vacation, I don't want to pay more for single occupancy versus double occupancy. And then the one that everybody's going to shake their head on for sure is the tax structure. <laughs> There's a singlehood penalty built into the tax structure. I love the work by Dorothy Brown, who wrote The Whiteness of Wealth. And one of her arguments is that we should all file as single. And I'm like, I'm all for it. And if we can't <laughs> file as single, I want everybody to file as family. And I, Chris Marsh, want to file as a family <laughs> and get my tax break <laughs> as a family. But, but, but Mark, this is where I think this is really, really, really important. Because one of the things I try to do in the book, I try to offer a structural conversation to singlehood. We mm -hmm. often leave singlehood at the individual level. And so what I say is that structural forces constrain personal choices for Black America, especially right. Black women. If I were to say that differently, racism and gendered racism constrains personal choices. If I were right. to give you an example, if I, Chris Marsh, want to partner with another Black, heterosexual Black man making $250,000 a year, uh, is an MBA, owns his own home, and has estate planning, he's simply not there. Yeah. And then at the yeah. end of the day, so so he's not there. So structural forces have constrained my personal choices. And now you're still not going to allow me to be defined as a family. That's insidious. And I'm pushing yeah. back against that. <laughs> yeah. Were you surprised by any of the data that you came across when you did this research? I mean, were there assumptions that you went into this research thinking and then the data or, you know, in your conversation, stuff just played out differently that really surprised you. N not necessarily, but I I want so I do want to be balanced. So mm -hmm. for the majority of the cohort, majority of their life, they're so happy. Like if it gets if, if it happens, great, but I'm not going to settle. Um, And so I appreciate that. But there were that people talked about how they weren't. Um, they had situational loneliness. They weren't chronically lonely where they had to pull the covers up over their heads. They couldn't get out of the bed. They had to pull the shades. They stayed in bed for six weeks on end. They sometimes had situational loneliness and it was small. It was because of like maybe like a holiday, like Valentine's Day yeah, or right, New Year's right. Eve. They would be mildly lonely. But then they get they get with their friends. They, they regroup, they pivot and they would be fine. So this whole notion like, you know, these single people are miserable. They hate life, you know, and one person talking about how they bought a dog, they buy a cat, they buy dogs, and they're miserable. All of that just does not show up in the data. And I'm so happy that it didn't because I, the, the assumption is we're unhappy and we're clearly not unhappy. Here's what something, something that did kind of um, was interesting. And I don't know how, I don't know what other word to use. I've interviewed 62 people, 42 women and 19, uh, 20 men, I think. Um, and no one really talked about sex. Only two people in the cohort talked about sex. And I believe I put it in a footnote that they talked about sex. Like I, I, Because they didn't talk about it, I didn't want to talk about it. But because they didn't talk about it, I felt like I had to talk about it. Because I think the <laughs> assumption is people will quite easily, because I've been, I've been talking about the book for a while now. People easily want to associate singleness with being promiscuous. And it just did not show up in the data. 
So much so, Mark, I kid you not. People were like, well, Chris, did you ask the right questions? Maybe they didn't feel comfortable <laughs> talking about sex. I was like, how about singles just didn't talk about sex? How about singles just didn't talk about sex? How come you have to equate the two? So that's where people are just so surprised. They think that there's a fundamental flaw in the research because only two out of 62 people talked about it. And that's not the case. And we don't, they don't necessarily talk about it. How about sexuality? How much did sexuality play into this cohort that you sat down and talked with? So that's funny that you asked that question because we recruited right here in the DMV and we were trying to find people a part of the LGBTQIA plus community, but we only had one. His name was Peter that openly identified as these are these are all pseudonyms, but Peter's right. the only one who openly identifies as part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Okay. You you mentioned earlier about loneliness, right? And we, we're reading all these articles in newspapers, national newspapers about this kind of epidemic of, of loneliness. And, and we've often talked about sociologists have political scientists of, you know, black people being kind of the canary in the coal mine in American society. Um, do you think the Love Jones cohort has something to teach America, right, about navigating loneliness? Absolutely. And again, I think this gets back. People often say like, oh, you know, I want to be in a relationship. And I'm like, okay, what kind of relationship do you want to be in? Because we are in non-romantic nurturing relationships. So please say that you want to be in a romantic relationship. But it is the Love Jones cohort has clearly shown that they have families. They do not consider themselves to be alone. They have have and value and nurture non-romantic nurturing relationships. And I think other people should follow the model of the Love Jones cohort, especially as you age. And, you know, it's funny because um, people talked about being single and living alone. And, you know, they sometimes, you know, they go to their homes and they're alone and they're okay with that. But it's really horrible when you're married Mm-hmm. And you still feel like you're alone. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And so the Love Jones cohort, they really do value friendships. And I even talk in the book about if you don't buy my argument about a family of one, I really think we need to institutionalize augmented family. I'm drawing from Andrew Billingsley's work, talking about non-romantic nurturing relationship. We should be able to institutionalize those families, those 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 couple, th- those relationships, and be considered a family because we not we are aging, and we need to start thinking about late and later in life medical decisions yeah. and someone that could right. advocate for you. So if you have somebody who's a non-romantic partner, there's no reason why we can't develop um, some kind of institutionalized family, especially for estate planning as well. You know exactly where your assets are going to go to. So I think we need to push back against this idea that it has to be, wealth has to be transferred from parent to child or late life plan, estate um, health health issues. It has to be like a spouse or a partner or a child. It can be a really good friend that advocates for you and makes decisions for you. As you've been talking about this book around the country the last few months, um, how's the general response been? The response has been good. Uh, people typically say, <laughs> typically they typically say three things. One, they say thank you. I've been I've been seen, and you give us another narrative. And I'm not again. I'm not anti marriage, but I'm just offering another narrative for how you can think about living your adult life. People say they've learned something. And people say, this feels like it's a movement. And so it's been well received. I went to South Africa and did a book talk in South Africa. And um, there were some people, I was on the radio show, a radio show. And they said, "Uh, don't bring those westernized views. Everybody needs to be married and needs to be partnered here. (laughs) And then a lot of women pushed back and said, you know, gender-based violence in marriages and partnerships are really (laughs) high in South Africa. Dr. Marsh is onto something. She's uncovering something we should be talking about. And we're forcing all of these young girls to be in marriages that are abusive and we need not do that or in partnerships that are abusive. And so everybody has to at least stop and think about what I'm saying. And mm. the book really res- should resonate with everybody because single is a title that we all have held at one point in time. Point, yep. Yes. Yeah. You entered interviewed most of these folks back in 2015, um, yes. correct? So it's, so it's eight years later. Um, how many of the Love Jones cohort have actually gotten partnered or married since then? I don't know. I sent an email out saying, hey, the book is out. I'm going to send you complimentary copies of the book. I promise I'm getting to the post office real, real soon to put those in the, <laughs> in the mail. But um, I only got responses from about 
maybe 20% of the cohort. So I didn't ask if they were partnered or married. What's next for you, Dr. Marsh? So, <laughs> like you said, I collected the data in 2015, and it took me quite a while. It took me seven years to write the book. Part of the reason why it took me seven years to write the book is because once I collected the data, I started doing implicit bias training with police officers. We will not talk about that today, but <laughs> I needed to find an outlet, and I needed to find something to do, and so I took up golf. I golfed. I took golf lessons 20 years ago in 1999. I revisited golf in 2019, and so I started playing golf as a hobby and as a sport. Yes, I've seen the photos on IG. <laughs> like, right, right, right. Your girl's out there killing it. But I also think, you know, I, I can't turn my sociological imagination off. And so I do plan to write a whole book about golf because mm. um, uh, I think it's, it's actually more so a book about sociological terms. And I'm using golf as a concrete way for us to think about some of these terms. Again, thinking about like race, class, gender, intersectionality, intersectionality. And so it's funny because golf is one of the first last sports to desegregate. But I often say, I was like, so the way golf kind of feels to me, you're invited to the dance, but you're not asked to dance. And so mm. I've been watching the Howard golf team because, you know, Steph Curry gave them a lot of money and mm -hmm. they started a new golf. They, they re revitalized their golf program and watching the aggressions, micro and macro aggressions, this blatant racism that these um, students have to deal with. I was like, oh yeah, I'm writing a whole book about yeah. golf. And so I, I'm sure that, that the Howard swimmers are dealing with some of that same. Dynamic oh, also. and they're killing the, they're killing it right now, too. Right. <laughs> yeah. So like the, the tentative title what was going to be birdies, bogeys. Those are both golf terms. Birdies, right, bogeys, right. bitches and blacks. But my mother would absolutely spank me if I put. <laughs> That's a great title, though. <laughs> OK, OK. Right. So I settled. I settled on. I was like, because that people would definitely pick that up. So I'm settling on birdies, bogeys. And the Blacks. Uh -huh. Here come the Blacks. And how navigating racism and sexism on the golf course. And so I think it's really important to think about um, some sociological terms. And people that people that are golfers will learn something about sociology. And people that are sociologists will learn something about golf. about golf. <laughs> We've been joined today by Professor Chris Marsh, Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Maryland College Park. We talked about her brand new book, The Love Jones Cohort, Single and Living Alone in the Black Middle Class, published by Cambridge University Press. Thanks for joining us today, Chris. Thank you so much for having me, Mark Anthony Neal. <laughs> black lights and boots burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything.